station. This is LBC with Ian Dale at Drive. Call 0345 60 60 973. Text 84850. Tweet at LBC. Hello, very good afternoon. It is four minutes past four here on LBC. You're listening to Ian Dale at Drive. In a moment, we'll be talking to Alex Salmon. If you'd like to ask him a question, 0345 6060 973. And you can dial up the internet, watch us live on the LBC website at lbc.co.uk. Uh, we'll also, after five, be talking about the Queen's speech. The main announcement that I thought was quite interesting was about prison reform. We covered this a little bit earlier in the week. Now, the government has said it wants to introduce weekend prison do you think that's a good idea or another example of politicians going soft? That's coming up after five here on LBC. Alex, welcome. Now, big day in Parliament today, the Queen's mm. speech. You, you've come hot foot from the chamber. Well, um, before we start, I'm going to play you the moment you left the <laughs> chamber while Jeremy Corbyn was in full flow. Here was the reaction. Emergency services were called out. Were called. Mr. Speaker, emergency services were called out 26,600 times in or over 20 minutes on average to incidents in UK prisons last year. Well, there's a bit of a stir there. I wonder whether emergency services were being called out to bring you here. Well, they, I mean, they, they thought it was a walkout because I was, <laughs> Jeremy had been droning on a bit. And, and for the first time in Queen's speech history in 40 minutes, not taking any interventions whatsoever. But it wasn't. I was just coming to, to speak to you, the award-winning Ian Dale. You got uh, that in within the, one and a half uh, minutes. About, That's about, very good. Uh, about Thank the you. Queen's speech. And it wasn't a, a walkout. I mean... I have to say, for I mean, look, I'm, as you're well aware, uh, the most sympathetic person just about, well, certainly out with his own party, and perhaps even within his own party, to Jeremy, because, uh, you know, I, I thought he's a very principled guy over a long period of time, but you cannot, you cannot not take any interventions on the loyal address. Because for the, for the people listening who don't maybe know as much about parliamentary procedures as you do, the, the, today is a day when the Prime Minister makes a speech, the Leader of the Opposition mm -hmm. makes a speech, there's sort of two set-piece backbench speeches, and they're all supposed to be a little bit funny, humorous, and they take interventions, and there's a little bit of what young people might call bants. Right, well, you, you have the, the, the loyal day, you get the proposal in second, or the proposal is a, you know, a deadbeat uh, the politician who has had you know been in office and usually makes the most glorious have you, have you speech. Done one? Uh, no, they, because you have to be in the government side, and surprisingly oh. enough, the, the SNP haven't taken over the uh, the English seats as of yet. <laughs> uh, but uh, and then the, a young MP or a newish MP makes the second one, and the, the generally speaking, that they're. they're they're a bit of fun and they're well worth listening to and sometimes and you know people make some you know within the general good humor some quite serious points then unusually in the comments the leader of the opposition goes first and then the leader of the opposition you really do firstly you talk about the two species you've heard and everybody enjoys that and that gets you off to a good start then you've got to take interventions you mm. must absolutely must show you're in command of the the subject then you deliver what you wanted to say, a, you know, a devastating critique of the Queen's speech. Then you take a few more interventions, you sit down in a reasonable triumph. Now, Jeremy had obviously been told today, instructed, I can only believe it's this, under no circumstances, take any interventions. So he started off quite strongly, he had some very funny things to say about the proposal on seconder, and then he, he started on his speech. And, and eventually, of course, the people lose patience with the idea, because the Queen's speech, both the Leader of the Opposition and the Prime Minister, are meant to be an opportunity for backbenchers to get in their yeah. killer question. Whether it's a killer question or not depends well, on the circumstances. It'll be interesting to see how that's written up. Uh, let's go to your calls, 0345 973 Let's see if Abby in Maidstone has a killer question. Hello, Abby. Hello, hi, Mark. Good afternoon. Mr. Stanford, I'm a very good fan of yours. Um, the question I'd like to ask, do you think the statement David um, Cameron made about El Baghdadi and Putin will be happy if Britain leaves the EU is a good statement the Prime Minister should be making. Yeah, I, I have to say, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I think we should just deploy arguments. I mean, I keep hearing by various people, not just the Prime Minister, you know, we mustn't do something because Putin says, you know, Putin is for Brexit. Now, as far as I know, there's some colourful characters in the various out campaigns, but I don't think Vladimir Putin has been signed up uh, uh, by uh, 
by Boris Johnston to, to be his cohabitee. So I, I don't like an argument which says, you know, because this figure who we don't like says something, we must do the opposite. And there's no substantive evidence that I can see that Vladimir Putin is the brains behind the Brexit campaign. So my advice to the Prime Minister would be, look, rest on the arguments. You know, there's five weeks to go. It really is time to rest on the arguments because I think there's a good, substantive, positive case for Remain and I'm waiting, waiting, waiting why for the Prime Minister. Why isn't he making it then? I, I, I think I, I know why uh, and I, I can understand it to some extent. One is that so much of this debate for David Cameron has been an internal debate from the Conservative Party and I think it's very difficult to shift away from that. And secondly, of course, he had big success in the last year's general election by running a, you know, a fear campaign. You know, he can't get... Uh, Ed Miliband in because Alex Salmond will be telling him what to do or Nicola Sturgeon will be running the country, etc. And they think that was very successful. I just wonder if, you know, Project Fear has had its day. And I really, really, really would like the Prime Minister to get on to the substantive, because de facto, he's leader of the Remain campaign. Just as in the Scottish referendum, I was leader of the of the Yes campaign. Mm. De facto, the Prime Minister leads it, and he's setting the wrong note, in my opinion. It's interesting that we, we've been asking our listeners for questions for David Cameron. I'm interviewing him tomorrow afternoon. We've had several hundred so far, and I would say around 40% of them highlight on this point that, sorry, Prime Minister, y y you're making us actually turn the other way by deploying these kind of arguments. And I wonder whether he realises that there is a, certainly a body of opinion out there that is being completely turned off by it. But, well, I... I think that is a real danger. Uh, I mean, incidentally, I don't, David Cameron probably doesn't know about last night's award. Otherwise, he'd have enough of that. <laughs> Thank but, you. Uh, well, I'm just allowing you to sound modest. <laughs> so, but, but I think it's a, you know the biggest danger I think to remain winning this uh, referendum. Uh, I think is differential turnout, uh, and I can't believe that you can motivate people on a fear-led mm. campaign. Uh, I think obviously you can scare people, you can, but I don't think you can motivate people, and, and therefore. I really, really, really would like remain led by the Prime Minister, but if necessary, the Labour Party and ourselves have the obligation, now the elections are over, to get on to the positive side and the positive okay. case for Europe, which I think is a strong one. Well, let's keep your calls coming. 0345 6060 if you'd like to put a question to Alex on any subject <laughs> you like. Let's first take a text, though, from Paul in Edinburgh. He says, why is the SNP resembling an episode of EastEnders? Front page of The Sun today is Alex embarrassed now i don't know if you can see this anybody that's watching on our website my romp with mp in y france this is um a scan well, so-called scandal about um a journalist a, a london based journalist who's apparently had an affair with two sets fairly senior smp mps does it resemble an episode of eastenders well you haven't done the full front page which is boris's right. wife well, we can come we can come, we can come, we can come uh, on I to think, that later well, you're not responsible uh, for boris no no, no i'm and not i'm i'm, I'm a, the custodian of, of of people in these matters i, I got elected to the house of commons in 1987 i've been in public life all that time not once in all that time have i commented on anyone else's private life whether whether opponent or somebody in my own and party I, and, and I, I understand i'm not that. i'm not going to break and I'm, you know this is true I do because no, I know, you remember I, the conversation about john yeah, whittingdale and i totally recently. understand that but i think this goes beyond sort of prurience about people's private life. helen in blackburn mm. says would it be wrong to claim public money for hotel rooms for a fling and that's one of the accusations here surely that has to be investigated well, I, i'm quite happy to answer that i mean if it's investigated it'll be flung out there is no expenses issue here whatsoever none whatsoever uh, people are allowed to so you'd be on. happy for ipso to investigate that uh, ipso anybody else can standards commissioner i mean the only person that's referred it is a, a tory msp called jackson carlo i think i can guarantee you a tory mp would never refer that because you would have wiped out half the parliamentary conservative party over the last 20 years or so so look there's no expenses issue here there's really an issue well, of well, people's there is, there private is. life. He, there's an issue Angus, of people's Angus private Angus life. Angus McNeil, and is and a who I know quite well, and I, I don't even like saying this, but he mm. spent quite a lot of money claiming expenses at the Park Plaza in Westminster, a hotel I stay in sometimes. Um, and uh, the allegation okay. is that he has used this hotel to conduct this affair. Right, OK. Two things. One, because I, I, I know Angus... Uh, uh, even better than you do. Uh, and for many, many years, uh, Angus McNeil was the lowest claiming member of parliament outside London uh, because he had a very modest owned flat in London where I think in memory he claimed something like £250 a month on and that made him the lowest claim MP. Now, the rules changed 
and he wasn't allowed to claim on that flat anymore because they said you couldn't claim on a flat you owned. That's why he went into hotel accommodation. But hotel accommodation is limited to £150 a night. And then, I mean, people can listen to this around the country, but I'll tell you, a hotel in central London, £150 a night, even you... Well, with, uh, your great it, sources would find that very Well, it is interesting that the, the papers are quoting £250 a night in the five-star no, no, plaza. I, per, I know that it doesn't cost that because I stay there and I wouldn't pay that. Right, but I, and I can also tell you you can only claim £150 a night. You don't yeah. get anything more than £150 a night. There is no expenses issue here. It is just, pure just one, It's one, people's private lives. One final lives, question And I'm not this. breaking my 30-year No, no, rule. that's fine. I know you're not going to. Just one final question, though. Um, in the last year, since you've had 57 MPs, it's fair to say that the SNP has had its fair share of scandals related to its MP. You've had, I think, at least one, if not two MPs uh, had to resign the whip, not uh, over this sort of mm. thing, but over sort of financial issues. Um, is, is this just endemic in all political parties? It happens in all political parties. Because, I mean, if this sort of thing was happening in another one, you, you, you might sort of find, particularly on the financial side, an excuse to have a go. Well, uh, the, uh, let me say about my two colleagues who've resigned the whip. I mean, they have not been charged with any offence. And let's just assume that people are innocent until proven guilty. And actually, I think that's a very good rule to have. Uh, as far as people's personal lives, I stick to my dictum that I've never commented on people's personal lives. I never shall. But, you know, okay. th those who are without sin should cast the first stone. OK, let's move on. Uh, David is in Colchester. Hello, David. Hi, uh, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. What would you like to ask? I, I'd like to just pose a question to Alex. And what I'd like to say is, he heard the saying, what's good for the goose is also good for the gander. Yes, I have, David. I've heard that saying. <laughs> so in, in, in the light of that wonderful uh, piece of the English language, could you tell me, if it's OK for you to call for a second referendum, why wouldn't it be OK for Nigel Farage to call for, for a second referendum? Well, I, I've never criticised uh, Nigel Farage for calling for a, for a, a second referendum. If, if you can get the people of the country... Let, let's say, for example, there was a Remain vote o on Europe. And if Nigel Farage was successful, or any other politician, Boris Johnson or whoever it was, could get a parliamentary majority on a mandate for calling a, another referendum, then, in my view, they would have the entitlement and right to do so. I don't think anybody can set a boundary on what a people want to do. But, uh, and but, therefore, but what, you have what to have percentage a, would put this to bed for a generation? Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I think it's much more a question of circumstances, Ian. Uh, you know, the, the phrase that Nicholas Sturgeon... 60-40? I mean, well, wouldn't, wouldn't but, that but be emphatic certainly enough? Certainly, if there was a large margin, then yeah. it's less likely there would be it, another it, it, referendum. It, 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 isn't the prob problem then that what we're doing is we're doing politics by referendum instead of allowing uh, elected parliaments to run the country? You can't have it both ways, David. I mean, pe people want yeah. more of a say. Yeah, but the trouble is, David, that I know uh, I, I, I sympathise with you generally, except for one thing. I think constitutional issues have to be decided by referendum, basically because they're about the constitution. But I you know I would. Uh, I, I was uh, be loath to have, for example, I thought the referendum on the voting system was, was to say the least, borderline, and so did uh, most of the people because there was a very low turnout. Uh, and that sort of thing, I think, you know, the members of parliament should decide economic policy, financial policy. The constitution of the country, however, and I have to say the European Union is the constitution of the country, uh, I, I think is a matter which has to be decided by referendum. Now, I wouldn't have had a referendum because I was for staying. I am for remaining. And I think you, one of the prime ministers... people have a say? No. I'm, I didn't propose that. Uh, and certainly it's not an issue of enormous contention in Scotland, as you know, among my uh, you know, the people who supported uh, the parties, all of which uh, are in favour of remaining uh, in Scotland, with the exception of UKIP, who you know, had a very small vote. But the, the issue is, if the people show a desire to have it, and if a party stands in a mandate like the Tories did, and then has the referendum... And it's a constitutional issue, they've got the right to do it. But then, of course, having done that, I don't see how anybody can foreclose on Nigel Farage. The only issue for Nigel Farage is going to have to get his number of MPs up from one to about mm. 350. OK, we are roughly halfway. Uh, 0345 6060973, if you'd like to ask Alex a question. You can, of course, watch us live on the LBC website. Brendan is in Belfast. Hello, Brendan. Hello, and congratulations on your award last night. Thank you very much. What would you like to say? That's reference, reference number three, Brendan. Well that's, done. That's quite enough for the rest of the programme. Uh, I'm very grateful. Brendan, what would you like to say? Okay. 
Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Salmond. Good afternoon. Uh, it's an honour, no matter how briefly, to uh, actually speak to you. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts were on the old Grand D, uh, Michael Hazeltine, coming out of the woodwork to tell us that Boris has basically gone to Lally. Uh, do you, what do you think of that? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, they, I mean, it, well, uh, the, the Tarzan, as Michael Hester used to be called, was a swinger, not a swinger in any other sense than, than uh, he, he, he went to the you House of Commons. One, <laughs> once upon a time, he was in the House of Commons and he, he swung the mace off the House of Commons round his head. I remember. Uh, I, I was 12. There was lots of jokes about that and swinging through the trees, etc. But these were in the days before there was any other illusion could be taken from these words. But he was always colourful in his language. Uh, and I think the you know the the, the battle with the blondes between Hesseltine and uh, and Boris has been <laughs> has been quite uh, entertaining. However, I still think this is an issue which should be substantially debated on the arguments for and against, and people should put forward on the Remain side a positive argument for Europe, and on the outside a perspective and prospectus of what happens if there's an exit. You know, is it going to be Switzerland and Norway? Is it going to be some sort of mid-Atlantic Singapore? Now, I think there's problems with both of these visions, but, you know, we deserve to know which vision it is. So you're saying Boris hasn't gone do I, I, I don't I think... Well, it hasn't gone do If he was do it he was always do I mean, Some, the, the, the pe- some people might Dulali say it was Michael cons- Heseltine that went do when he advocated us joining the Euro. Well, you, you can... Well, you might, you might, you must, you know, Michael Heseltine is a statesman of great, uh, of great well, were, reputation. Were you in favour of joining the Euro back in the day? I, well, I think everyone was. No, uh, no, they really uh, weren't, apart believe from me. from yourself, Ian, perhaps. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but you learn from uh, experience. So, you know, if, if, if circumstances and facts change, then you That's change a pretty big mind. thing to get wrong, though, wasn't it? Well, I would be in common with just about every other politician. Interesting, I was never in favour of the ERM. <laughs> but I was, no, I me thought, neither. I thought the euro might uh, solve some of the problems, but it was badly structured, and I'm no longer in favour right, of going a reasonable time joining the euro. We are going to head north now to Dingwall. Greg is in Dingwall. Hello, Greg. Hello, how are you this afternoon? Very well, thank you. What would you like to ask, Alex? Um, well, Alex, uh, my name's Greg Brain. Uh, my wife, Catherine, and my son, Lachlan, are here. Now, you may have seen some press coverage of our situation. Uh, our family, as you can tell from my outrageous accent, uh, we're from Australia. Uh, we were convinced to immigrate here based on Scotland's Fresh Talent program a few years ago and sold everything in Australia to follow this dream. Now, at the time, the Home Office told us that a two-year post-study work visa would be available at the end of Catherine's degree, which she's now passed. We both, until the until Home Office told us to quit them, had jobs that had been empty chairs for months before we were offered the positions and we've been paying taxes and integrating into our local communities, volunteering for charities, etc. We thought we were Theresa May's poster family for successful immigrants, to be honest, we willing to linguistically and culturally assimilate, pay our own way, live and work in what's a comparatively sparsely populated and economically depressed area of the UK. And... Uh, to my view, an immigration policy that would deport applicants such as us seems to be putting process ahead of outcomes that would benefit the entire country. What we're wanting, I suppose, is for the Home Office to live up to uh, what they promised to us when we decided to invest over £200,000 of our house sale proceeds into the UK. So I guess my question is, can you please lobby on our behalf and discuss our case with either Theresa May or James Brokenshire, the Minister for Immigration? Yeah, absolutely, I, I can. We, we have Greg. history on doing this, uh, don't we? We, we have history. Uh, Greg may not know this, but we but jointly our joint efforts were successful. A, a different case, but a, an equally compelling case. Uh, that, that was the, the Lady Myrtle Cothill, the, this 92-year-old South African lady who was going to be deported back to South Africa when her family wanted mm. to take care of I mean, her Very here. different circumstances. Very different circumstances, but, but in, that, uh, in that instance, James Brokenshire, hopefully partly due to our efforts uh, in this show, we exercise ministerial discretion. And I really do hope he exercises discretion in this case. This family came to Scotland as part of a, a, government, a Scottish government initiative to encourage people to come. They've integrated. I mean, I understand, uh, Greg, that young Lachlan's first language is Gaelic. Is that, that, that correct? It is true. He speaks English and Gaelic with equal facility, although it, because he goes to Gaelic medium education, he's had no formal instruction through his schooling in English yet. So yeah, it's uh, like that, Is Lachlan with you just now? He is. In fact, Lachlan may well be able to say uh, good afternoon to you. Just oh, hang on a moment. Go on. Absolutely. In, in Gaelic, if possible. That'd be great. Keskama. Keskama. Keskama, Lachlan. Well done to you. You, you. You've got more Gaelic than the former First Minister of Scotland, Lachlan. So that's a good afternoon. Well, look, it's an illustration. 
uh, you know, that young, young this family couldn't be doing more to be part of, and live up to that, that great initiative. And I really would hope that in, in this and all the other campaigns that are going on, the First Minister of Scotland has spoken this, the local MSP, the local MP, clearly this family is of benefit to the Highlands, of benefit to mm. Scotland. For goodness sake, let's James Brokenshire exercise the same discretion as he did on the other case we brought to his notice. Is this an example of where you think... I mean, obviously you want full independence from Scotland, mm. I get that, but in the, in, the me, in, the, in the meantime, do you think that sort of more powers on this sort of case ought to be devolved to Scotland? I, I do, uh, and we had a situation a bit like that a few years ago when we were able to exercise discretion on, on post-work visas for university students and also have this, what mm. was called, the Fresh Talent uh, uh, Initiative. You see, if you're in the Highlands of Scotland, then your number one concern has not historically been immigration. It's been emigration. Yeah, absolutely. It's been the loss of people, the loss of communities, the loss of facilities. Uh, and and if, you, if you draw a sort of line, so Scotland, Wales, including Ireland... It's a huge area where that's happening. Even even today, you look at the Republic yeah. of Ireland and 18, 20-year-olds, they all want to come over to England. Now, they can do so because they're in the EU. Well, well luckily, of course, in Ireland, at the, the economy is on the turn and they're coming back. <laughs> they're returning <laughs> to, to Ireland. But we know, we, we've managed to do a fair bit in the Highlands in particular. I mean, Inverness is one of the fastest-growing cities in the, uh, in the country now. But there's still many, many areas which could use it. Where Scotland and the Highlands are not full up. Mm -hmm. So for goodness sake... Let's have families like this who've got something to contribute to the country uh, and let's welcome them and salute what they're doing as opposed to trying to kick them out. Well, Greg and Lachlan, Alex is going to take up your case. We're going to keep on top of it. Hopefully, hopefully we might get you back on the show when there's some good news. Thank you very much for your call. John is in Ammonford in South Wales. Hello, John. Alex, hello, how are you? Um, Alex, it's, it's Mental Health Awareness Week and Jeremy Hunt, the Health Secretary, doesn't really have seen... He doesn't seem to have done anything to... Uh, raise concerns about mental health. In Scotland, one in three people have a mental health issue. In Ireland, it's something similar. And I was just wondering what you could think of to persuade Jeremy Hunt. Even the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge are actively promoting mental health. And yesterday, we had that terrible tragedy of um, Matthew Daly and the solicitor, Donald Locke. Um, so I just wonder what you could do to impress Jeremy Hunt that uh, it's an important subject. I mean, to be fair, Jeremy Hunt doesn't have anything to do with the Welsh Health Service or the Scottish Health yeah. Service. True, uh, and uh, John, but it's still a great point. Uh, and I, I think, you know, health authorities across these islands, you know, have had mental health as the the poor relation of the, of the health service for, for far too long. And I was pleased to see, incidentally, that this emerged as a... A significant area of debate in the recent Scottish elections uh, and I saw very very impressive uh, speeches on it from both uh, the Liberal uh, leader and from Nicola Sturgeon during the campaign debates uh, which I thought was a, a you know quite a breakthrough that you know this issue should emerge as a s serious topic of discussion during the big debates which you wouldn't have got maybe a few years ago and there was commitments made to increase funding in Scotland and I hope the the same path is followed in England a, particularly given the the welcome support of, of royalty and other key personalities to draw attention to this, and of course the the tragic case that uh, that's mentioned that John mentions is uh, just an illustration of uh, of why it's uh, a substantial investment in the future not to have mental health as a poor relation of the health service any longer. John, thank you for that. Before we go to David in Glasgow, um, Andy Burnham, it's emerged this afternoon that he's definitely going to run as mayor of Manchester. What what does it say? about uh, the Labour Party that he's actually willing to resign from Parliament because he's Shadow Home Secretary, one of the top positions. I, I think it's quite significant. I, I had some inside information on this, incidentally, because, uh, Andy, I was on Question Time with him uh, from Hull just a couple of weeks back. The, the one you go before. to all the glamorous places. Well, that like. was a great audience, incidentally, and Andy did extremely well, you know, talking yeah, about uh, uh, the, uh, the Hillsborough tragedy and... Uh, and other aspects. It was a nice, it was a good audience, a very lively audience. Uh, and Andy afterwards asked my advice, or I'm not saying, uh, and about what to do. And of course, I actually said, well, look, you know, I, I think you should at least wait till after the European referendum because there could be total turmoil in politics. You don't know mm. where the cards are going to fall. But he was very certain that he saw a change, a positive change in politics. Uh, he thought that when he was talking about the Scottish elections, and he was talking about the, the mayor of London, and he was saying that you know perhaps more could be done in some of these local posts than you, perhaps even as home sector, but certainly a shadow home sector you could do. So I do think it is a bit of a commentary on the, the current state of the Labour Party. Clearly he's not 
happy with one of the candidates for leadership. But I, I just okay. want to find about Andy Furnham. That programme and a number of speeches he's made since, and I, I thought which I thought were very impressive because obviously Hills was very, very deep uh, for him. You wonder where that, that passion was during the, the leadership no, campaign last year. And uh, so good luck to him. That's just, what I'd like to say. Just, good on, luck to him. just on that, would you ever consider running for mayor of Edinburgh or Glasgow? Well, we don't have directly elected. So you could do. <laughs> I mean, they're being brought in for English cities. Why not in uh, well, Scotland? I, well, I think uh, we rather believe uh, uh, that uh, the system we've got in Scotland is well, fine. I, now. I suppose I mean, once you run the country, you don't really want to run a city, no, do no, you? No, it's not that. I mean, I, think these are, I, mean I, I, I don't think we should regard things in, in that way. I mean, it was a privilege of my life to be first so, minister so you, of Scotland, you, and it would be difficult to beat that experience. So you don't think more power should be devolved to Scottish cities? Oh, that, that's a different issue from directly elected, uh, uh, well, provosts, as we would have, incidentally. You know, there'd be direct elected provosts of, of, of Scotland. I love it as well. Uh, but that, that's, you can have more powers for the cities okay. of Scotland as the funding is going in at the present moment without having directly elected uh, provosts. Quick call from Sam in Reading. Hello, Sam. Hello. Hello. What's, you what's, your, what's your question, Sam? Um, uh, good afternoon, Alex. My question is, uh, on what grounds do you think Tony Blair should be impeached? Well, I, I think Tony Blair should be impeached or some other legal process should be found if the Chilcot report finds for predetermination. Predetermination would mean that Blair committed to war in 2002 at Crawford Ranch with George W. Bush. Uh, and if, what law would that have broken? Oh, well, it breaks several. I mean, in the terms of the International Criminal Court, there's a range of offences that can be investigated. That would certainly come into them because it would be not a war but, but of... But why bring this up now? I mean, you're, you're at the centre of the a group well, of MPs, I gather, who are, who are looking into this. Well, why bring this up now? Why not wait until the chill well, well, inquiry is reported? Well, I'll, I'll come to that directly. The MPs we're assembling next week are the same MPs who pursued the impeachment process, the ones that are left in Parliament uh, 10 years ago. And that came, if you remember, to a climax in October 2006 when we came within 25 votes of forcing this through. And incidentally, if we'd forced it through, then the inquiry would have been over long, long ago. And the people and the relatives in particular of the 179 mm. British soldiers who died would have had the answers that they wanted. Now, secondly, why we bring it up before the report? Because we want to be ready. Now, I accept that there has to be, in order to justify this, that finding, that central finding in the Chilcot report of predetermination. Why is that important? Because if that is found, then everything that happened after it, the, the whole dodgy dossier, the manufacturing of evidence, came about because he was not evaluating whether or not war was necessary. He decided to go to war and was manipulating and, and the in, evidence. in your gut... Is that what you really think happened? Yes, absolutely. I've thought that for, for many years. And in my guts, in my heart, in my soul, I believe he committed this country to an illegal war. And you think he should personally take the consequences for that? Yes, I do. And I'll tell you why. Because, look, so, you know, I was on one of these advisors the other day in a, another programme, and they said, oh, well, politicians, you know, manipulate unemployment statistics, they gild the lily. Yeah, I think politicians do that, myself included. I've gilded the lily on statistics in the past, but this is not about the economy or statistics. This is not about even things as important as health statistics. This is about peace or war, and you cannot gild the lily, manufacture evidence when you're sending people to their deaths. And you would like to see... I mean, what are the consequences for him on a personal level? If he was taken to the international... Uh, Criminal the court. ICC in, in The Hague, what, what could they do? Well, they have, uh, they, but the, the key point about the ICC, it has a prosecutor a number of prosecutors and it doesn't have to be a government who take a case although it normally is a concerned group of citizens if they have a body of evidence and that's crucial can take that to the ICC prosecutor and ask for an investigation and a potential prosecution now there might be other ways to do it and one of the reasons for assembling the group of MPs and the legal experts who helped us some years ago is to find a remedy if indeed the Chilcot report puts its finger okay. on that evidence. Well, we have, what, seven weeks to find uh, that out. Alex, thank you very much. We will see you again next week. In a moment, we're going to talk about one of Alex's favourite politicians. Is Donald Trump right when he says he'd happily meet North Korean leader Kim Jong-un? That's outrageous. He, he won't come on our <laughs> programme, but he's going to meet North <laughs> Korean leader well, Kim. Uh, well, apparently he's coming to this country in July or August, so uh, we will find out. Who, who's madder, Kim Jong-un or Donald Trump? Oh, it's a, a toss-up. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, thank you very much. This is LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's 4.33, news time with Ros Unwin. The Labour leader says the government has yet to understand the consequences of cuts. Jeremy Corbyn claims the Conservatives' new policies in the Queen's